Hello, my name is Fritz Kao, and welcome to my YouTube channel, Fritz Kao Vids. If you like this video, hit the like button. If you want more videos like this, please subscribe. Increasingly, we live in a world where nothing makes any sense. Events come and go like waves of a fever, leaving us confused and uncertain. Those in power tell stories to help us make sense of the complexity of reality. But those stories are increasingly unconvincing and hollow. For 10 years, the country had been battered and torn apart by waves of economic and social chaos. Reagan set out to give the country a new sense of purpose. He took all the problems, even the most complex, and turned them into reassuring moral fables. And abroad, the world he depicted was one where although good might struggle with evil for a while, in the end, goodness and innocence would triumph. We have it in our power to begin the world over again. Conflicts that in the past would have been seen as political struggles were redefined. They became instead battles against dark demonic forces that threatened innocent people. And the role of we, the good people of the West, was to intervene to save those innocents. One of the places this dream began was Afghanistan. America was already helping the rebels who were fighting the Russians. But Reagan increased the aid massively and made it the symbol of his new vision. He even dedicated the space shuttle to the Afghan freedom fighters. Just as the Columbia we think represents man's finest aspirations in the field of science and technology, so too does the struggle of the Afghan people represent man's highest aspirations for freedom. Accordingly, I am dedicating on behalf of the American people the March 22nd launch of the Columbia to the people of Afghanistan. But right from the beginning, there was a dangerous, destructive force at the very heart of this project. This was because Reagan's partner in the battle to bring freedom to Afghanistan was Saudi Arabia. The Saudi intelligence agencies worked with the CIA to ship arms and money to the Afghan rebels. On the surface, the Saudis did this because a fellow Muslim country had been invaded by communists. But it was also part of their attempt to export the dangerous fundamentalism at the heart of their own society. In 1979, a group of Saudi radicals had taken over the Grand Mosque in Mecca. For two weeks, the authorities had fought running battles with the insurgents. They discovered that a number of the attackers had been taught by the most senior religious leader in the country. It made the ruling family realize just how fragile their grip on power was. So as well as sending them money and the weapons, they encouraged young radicals to go and fight in Afghanistan. One of them was a young Osama bin Laden. The aim was to divert their anger. But it meant that with the arms would also come the pessimistic and intolerant version of Islam, Wahhabism. 
To begin with, these ideas would have little influence in Afghanistan. But they would take hold there and mutate into a dark and violent force that was completely at odds with Reagan's vision of freedom. And to confirm for many Afghans that the United States had not brought democracy or free markets to their country, but instead a corrupt crony capitalism that had taken over Afghanistan and its government. Which was the very same allegation that was being made against politicians at home in America and in Britain. At the end of 2014, British soldiers left Afghanistan. All the bases were wiped out, as if nothing had been there. Even the war memorials were packed up and taken back to Staffordshire. They weren't the only fighters who had left Afghanistan. Abu Musab al-Zakawi had gone to Afghanistan to fight the Soviets back in the 1980s. Then he had stayed on to work with Osama bin Laden. And in 2003, he went to Iraq and set up a jihadist group called Al-Qaeda in Iraq to fight the American invasion. Al Zakawi was powerfully influenced by bin Laden's ideas, but he took them much further. He and his group killed anyone who they decided did not believe in their fundamentalist ideas and deserved to die. Even the original founders of Al Qaeda were shocked and they sent him a letter telling him to stop killing civilians. But al-Zakawi ignored them. He was convinced that the insurgency in Iraq could be used to spread an Islamist revolution throughout the Arab world. <laughs> But before he could do this, the Americans found al-Zakawi and dropped a large bomb on him. But it didn't stop the spread of the idea. Despite al-Zakawi's death, his organization survived and began to mutate into something even more ferocious and ambitious. But as it did so, it was possessed by ghosts from the past. What re-emerged was the fierce, intolerant vision of Wahhabism that had survived from the 1920s. It had spread outwards through Afghanistan in the 1980s and 90s, where it had become mixed with modern Islamist ideas. But now, Faced by the nihilistic horror of post-invasion Iraq, any idea of building a new revolutionary future disappeared. And instead, the conservative and backward-looking Wahhabism became the dominating influence, with its desire to retreat to an imagined past. In 2013, the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant was formed, known as ISIS in the West. Its aim is to create a unified caliphate throughout the Islamic world. And although it uses the techniques of modern media, it is at heart the same violent dream that had driven the Bedouins who had created the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia in the 1920s. Back then, the King of Saudi Arabia 
had found it necessary to try and exterminate them, because they too wanted to go on and conquer the whole of the Islamic world. He machine-gunned them in the bleak sands of the Arabian Peninsula. And now, the Saudis, along with the British and the Americans, are trying to do the same thing again, to kill the jihadists and their ideas in the sand dunes of northern Iraq and Syria. But it is an uncertain war. Western politicians are having to accept that the simple division between good and evil doesn't exist. By bombing ISIS, they are helping the evil President Assad to remain in power. And those in charge don't even know how big a threat ISIS really is. Is it a dark existential threat? Or is it really a front being used in an ongoing complex power struggle inside Iraq? We just don't know. At the end of the Soviet science fiction film, Solaris, the astronaut returns home. Everything seems real and normal, but somehow he doesn't trust in anything any longer. Although we have returned from Afghanistan, our leaders also seem to have lost faith in anything. And the simple stories they tell us don't make sense any longer. Remember, if you like the video that I made, hit the like button. And don't forget, if you want more videos like this, to subscribe.